guys, it's Marcus here. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay. And I think the screen, I think your screen just, there we go. There, cool. Okay. <laughs> it went uh, sideways on us. Now, are you uh, using a phone or? Phone, just like yeah. a, Okay, cool. Cool. So um, I think we are live. Yes, looks like we're live. So if you guys can hear me, let me know by typing something in the box. And today we have a special guest, Caitlin. I will let you pronounce your last name because I've been trying to think about it and I have like five ways I could possibly <laughs> say it. So... <laughs> Deed. 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 Okay, cool. Awesome. All right. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about sobriety. We're going to talk about identity crisis, and we're going to talk about crazy unwanted thoughts that sometimes creep up on us. So let me make sure my sound is off on this replay here. That way we don't get any feedback. All right, Andrea, good to see you there. All right, so we're going to go ahead and dive right in. Uh, what I really want to talk about is when I first got sober, I had a huge identity crisis issue. Um, a lot of you guys know that I run businesses online and everything like that. And when I was drinking, that was part of my identity. I looked at it and I was like, okay, well, I drink and I'm the internet guy and I'm successful and I have to put up this facade and I have to be this person that I thought I was. And it was very difficult because I, I tried to live up to it, but as I was drinking, my state of mind and body deteriorated and it was kind of like out the window right i was like okay well i'm supposed to be this person but i'm not and then i also had a lot of you guys know uh, about my religious background i was very religious back then and uh, i was trying to keep that up where i was like okay well how can i claim to believe in bible and god and everything but i'm a drunk right how, how does that work and it was very difficult uh, to rationalize those things. And I brought Caitlin on today because she has a story that's that's a lot similar. And I think her, uh, you're from Story Speak Enterprises, right? Yeah. All yeah. right, cool. Awesome. And, and she does, she talks about stories, the stories we tell in our life, the stories we tell to ourselves, the tor stories that we tell to others. Um, and I know as an alcoholic and as a person who just lives in the world, um, I tell stories all the time. I'm like, I was this guy. I was abused. I was uh, treated good I was treated bad and, and we wear these stories like a backpack and we carry them through life as you know a badge of honor or determining who we are um, and as you guys have found out from my channel I believe that we never really know who we are uh, we just kind of go through and, and we are the essence of whatever we are right um, and it's kind of interesting so um, Caitlin if you want to start out and kind of tell your story like what it was like for you um, what kind of stuff happened uh, what you know you went through I know um, there were some issues there with, with uh, domestic stuff, and you can go into that or not. Um, yeah. It's like the first time I've ever talked to her, so I, I don't want to step on any toes. <laughs> um, our first conversation, and we'll just dive into all the, the deep, okay. deep stuff. <laughs> cool. That's cool. Um, okay. So, yeah, thank you, Marcus. So, yeah. yeah, Marcus was right. We do have a lot in common. And I, um, uh, he reached out to me because he had seen one of my videos where I was telling a story about what I had most recently experienced. Um, but for the sake of this video, I'll give a little bit of background with my experience with alcohol as well. Um, I wouldn't call myself an alcoholic by any means or an addict, but I did grow around a lot of loved ones who I had seen, you know, experience a lot of loss because of drugs, okay? And of course, like most Americans, we're conditioned to believe that alcohol, like, it's fine on the weekends, like, it's so normal to get totally trashed and, uh, you know, numb yourself out with emotions. So I had a, a bout in my life mm -hmm. where I was using alcohol to cope. Um, and instead of learning how to take control of my mind, I would um, numb myself out and escape with alcohol, right? And I, I got into many car accidents, like one that was very bad. And, you know, I'm blessed to not have, honestly, like a DUI or anything. So thankfully that's passed. But one thing I learned after that bout in my life was the power of my mind. And I was diagnosed with PTSD, um, I think in 2014. Mm -hmm. And um, I had recently, uh, that that came from uh, growing up in a home that was not emotionally nurturing or supportive, right? So I could not express herself, myself. And I think a lot of people who go to alcohol, um, Marcus, you could probably relate to this. You know, we live in our heads because we can't really it's not a safe place in our homes to express ourselves. Mm -hmm. So when that happens, you know, we have this raging mind and we have all these things we want to say, but there's no safety net to say it. And mm -hmm. it can kind of, you can become your own worst enemy. Um, so fast forward to the video Marcus saw. Um, most recently, 
I had um, been with a con artist, like legit con artist, master manipulator, who was a public figure. And uh, um, he really, being being with that person, really sh shined a light on what uh, what I had in myself that was attracting this, you know, the beliefs I had to uh, accept things from this per person, to accept um, being abused, because uh, let's, basically I ended up giving every dollar to this person. Um, I didn't feel safe in body or in the home because, and, and he was telling me I was crazy. He was trying to get me to go on pills, um, telling me I was bipolar. Um, and you know, I, I could not trust myself. And this is the root of everything is not trusting ourselves is the root I believe of every addiction because it's a, it's a lack of connection with yourself. So, um, at the time I had, um, I had to flee from the situation. So I went to, I flee to a domestic violence shelter. Um, kind of like this, like, um, witness protection program, like you, no one knows where it is. It's very, very hush hush. And, um, that's where I really understood the power of my mind and that, oh my God, I could trust myself and my intuition was correct. And I learned to align uh, my intuition and my thoughts. And I think Marcus and I are gonna talk more about that, um, but that's pretty much the synopsis. Um, and, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and that's uh, very similar. Like I see a lot of things. Like I was diagnosed with PTSD. Now I don't mm. I don't like to say that I have PTSD because it wasn't like a it was right. a therapist diagnosis. It wasn't like a doctor thing. And then I look at like yeah. people who went to war, and I'm like, okay. I mean, I know I'm not like that. I I, I, I want to respect theirs, you know, and be like, okay, yeah, I didn't go to war. So, um, but it does affect the way you are, and and like you said about trusting yourself. I remember um, when I was going to a therapist in uh, like 2013, 2014. Um, I have notebooks. I write notebooks about everything. I guess it's not like a diary. It's like little ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember I took my notebook to therapy that time, and I was shaking like a leaf because I was so anxious, and the, the alcohol was wearing off, and. Um, and I had written on my book because I couldn't even say it out loud to the therapist. I was like, I don't trust myself. Wow. Um, and, and to me, I was like, this is the epiphany. This is it. This is going to get me sober. This is, if I could, you know. Um, and it's funny because when I got sober, I don't know how much of my story you know, but um, I was doing the internet marketing thing. I was very successful at it. Um, we had planned to move to Florida. We had like moving vans lined up. We had our house sold. Um, which I sold my house completely drunk. I don't even remember it other than the guy who bought our house was like seven feet tall and I'm like five <laughs> feet tall. So it's like, whoa, this dude's huge. Um, and I was like, wow, our house looks small with, with that guy in it. With me, five feet, it looks big. Um, and so there we were and I was like, okay, I don't trust myself. And I, I had uh, gotten really bad. I was, I was going like two weeks off of drinking, like a month on. And I'd, I'd cycle this and I, I got really bad uh, we ended up not selling our house. I ended up in a uh, hospital because of the drinking, and uh, there was a suicide watch I was on. Um, and then I ended up in a mental hospital, which was not fun, very scary. Luckily, my, my talking abilities got me out in four hours instead <laughs> of, like, the 72 hours they're required to hold you. Because um, I was scared. I mean, there was people there yeah. that were, like, talking to the grass. There was a lady there that was, like, she looked like she was just going to jump up and poke your eye out. <laughs> um, and she was just clutching her pillow, you know, and, and, and it's funny because I, I had that moment in the mental hospital where I was like, Marcus, dude, you don't belong here. Mm. And then there was a voice in my head that said, nope, this is exactly where you belong. Because uh, I went crazy. I, I believed all the shit that society put on me. I believed all the stuff that I thought in my own head. And it was so real. And I was like, okay, well. What do I do with this? I, I literally am crazy because I bought the game. Like, I, like some people buy the game and they're like, okay, well, I got to have a job. I got to be successful. Yeah. And if I don't get it, whatever. I bought it where it was like, I got to have the, the job. I got to be successful. And if I don't have it, I'm worse than scum. Like, I, I should be mm -hmm. dead. Um, and I, I believe that with everything that was in me. And I, and I literally just lost it. And I didn't understand what it meant to trust myself. I was like, what does that even mean? And it's funny because in sobriety, I didn't really like sit down and be like, okay, let's get some books on, on trusting yourself and let's understand it. It was kind of like a byproduct of surrendering to the fact that I'm human, right? It was like a byproduct of saying, you know, if, if someone else was in my shoes and had the exact upbringing as me, had the same choices as me, they'd do exactly what I did. If I was in Caitlin's shoes and I was given the hand she got, with the mental upbringing she had, I'd be exactly where she is today. I'd be exactly where she was 
at our worst moment, at our, but it'd be the same. Because as humans, that's what happens. We go through this programming and we're like, we don't understand it. I don't get where it's coming from. Um, I don't get this and I don't trust myself when in reality, to me, trusting yourself is all about releasing control, saying, I, yeah. I don't know everything, right? So kind of interesting, but what are your thoughts on that? I'm really excited because <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I agree with everything you're saying. And so uh, if you don't mind, can I share an exercise that really helped me with this? Sure, yeah. With learning to trust yourself. So mm -hmm. um, essentially what you're saying, what you're describing is, you know, there's two sources of our thoughts, right? And our, mm -hmm. everyone thinks, just to clarify, every, um, a lot of people were told that our spirit is like in our body. Uh, mm -hmm. Really our spirit is our consciousness, right? Our minds. Mm -hmm. So, um, we have to know first off that our thoughts come from two sources, either love or fear. Mm -hmm. So honestly, the way I got like, when I had that epiphany, like you did that, like, oh, oh my God, I just need to trust myself. Like what? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I was kind of like, you know what? I remember sitting at a desk and I told uh, my mind, I was like, you know what? I'm tired of hearing these things. Like I'm just going to take, I'm going to manage it right now. Mm -hmm. And I got a piece of paper out and I drew a column down the middle. I'm sorry, a line to make two columns. Mm -hmm. And on the left, it says uh, honest thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. And then the right side says truth thoughts. Because what you said, you said you had believed all the thoughts that were in your head, right? Mm -hmm. But then you realize like, oh, I don't have to believe everything in my head. Like every, our thoughts are just a byproduct of our environment. Mm -hmm. And everything that I think is not necessarily mine. Mm -hmm. So then we have to learn how to create a filter that filters love and fear based thoughts. So the honest thoughts in the left column are the fear-based thoughts because just mm -hmm. because it exists doesn't mean it is. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Just yeah, because absolutely. it is present doesn't mean it's the truth. So then mm -hmm. the truthful thoughts are love. So this is where you, I learned to, uh, you know, they always, when we have a lot of trauma, what we mm -hmm. think is the truth is usually not. And this is where PTSD comes in because our gut, what people say, like, trust your gut, trust your intuition. Our intuition mm -hmm. is, has been messed up, you know, <laughs> exactly. because uh, it feels, we feel things that we think is intuition, that we think is truth, that we think is love. But in reality, it's our, our detectors are off and it's fear-based and it will uh, sabotage us. Yeah. I think so, um, yeah. also like when we talk about intuition too, uh, a lot of people don't realize that intuition is also programmed. Um, you know, like I, mm. there's certain people that are programmed to intuition in baseball or basketball or whatever. For, unfortunately for me, I'm not sports minded. Um, but these guys, you know, they'll be sitting there looking at something and they'll just catch a ball. And it's like, dude, how'd you do that? And it's like, yeah. well, I have trained my intuition to watch out for it. And, you know, people like Caitlin and myself who have gone through issues where maybe it wasn't safe or maybe uh, they were abused or whatever. Um, all through your life, you're on the defense. Right. So yeah. for me, it was like I was bullied in school. I was bullied by a uh, step parent and I look at it and I'm like, I'm always worried about stuff. I always feel like a kid and I'm always worried that like someone's going to do something bad. And it's like, well, is that because I'm dysfunctional or I'm a freak out or whatever? Or is it just because I always had to be on guard? Therefore, I was trained. And now my intuition says, hey, watch out for that dude. Watch out for this guy. You know, that kind of thing. Mm. That's a good one. Yeah. So that's where we have to retrain it. And just for anyone who's watching who doesn't know, you know, we know now, but your gut, like your gut is connected to your brain. They're not separate. And this mm -hmm. is what the, the world would have you believe they are separate, but they're mm -hmm. not. Um, you have to learn. So when I made those columns, truth, uh, what is it? Fear, Fear based thoughts, which is honest. Yeah. And love based thoughts, which is truth. If you can get to a place where you quiet your mind and whenever it's like going off like crazy, you just kind of sit there. Uh, first thing is to get grounded, like grab a pen and a paper and just acknowledge every thought that is going in your head. And then after you write them all down, you start putting them in the columns. Okay, is this honest? Is it is it fear based or is this the truth? Is this love? And like by the end of it, on the paper that I had, you know, my truth was that, you know what? I am, I am loved because I am made from love. Mm -hmm. I am desired because I, uh, because I am love. <laughs> it all goes yeah. back to being love, you mm -hmm. know, it's crazy. Exactly. <laughs> and so yeah. once you embody that, it begins healing your mind naturally. There well, was a, there's a good book I had. I don't know if it's up here, but I'll try to draw what he had. 
And he had this thing, and it comes from Josh Jankowski, I think it was, or Josh, Josh Janowski, something like that. If you Google it, you'll probably find it. Uh, mm -hmm. The book my grandpa gave to me, um, it was called Love is Letting Go of Fear. Really good book. It's like from the 70s. And what mm -hmm. he does is he says, you know, there's, there's a thing going on here where you have you, right, and you have these fear-based thoughts, and you're like trying to push these fear-based thoughts out, and it's like a big spring, Right, and the spring's like this, and it's recoiling, and it's connected to whatever it's connected to. And you can either go through and try to push these thoughts back and be like, okay, I'm going to push these back because I hate these thoughts. And it's like a fight, right? You're trying to fight the spring, and you're trying to push it back. And even when you do get it back, there's yeah. that resistance, and you're like, okay, well, I'm trying to fight it. Now, on the other hand, he draws this thing, and he's like, well, you could live life where you forget about these thoughts because they're going to happen. You're going to have these thoughts. They're not going to go away all the time, but you can pay no mind to them, right? You can look at them and be like, of course I'm going to have these thoughts. I'm not going to worry. And so he has this picture of this spring. And for those of you that don't like my art, that's a spring. We'll just pretend it's a spring. And he's got this guy and he's just kind of like chilling out, relaxing. And he's like, hey, I can sit here and I can just lean up against these thoughts because they're going to be there in the back of my mind anyway. I don't need to fight them. I can live in a place of love and say, hey, this doesn't really matter. This isn't a big deal. Um, you know, I can focus on the things that do matter. Uh, and it's really good because the fear and love based thing is a very, very um, important thing that, uh, you know, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's such a good point. I want to point out to you, Marcus, to add to that. Um, someone had told me once, because I, when we get bombarded with, with thoughts that are not from us, mm -hmm. like you said, we can ignore them. Or we can also detect and say, oh, that's not mine. Mm -hmm. Okay, like, you know, I don't own that. We we have to stop identifying with those thoughts, like you said, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. And it's just kind of letting them pass, you know? And be like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, that's not mine. Um, someone told me once, because I often, I used to get lots of, uh, like, terrorizing dreams. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, I would just feel like terror, like in the middle of the day, Wh wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, just like, like panic hit me. And someone told me once he looked at me, he's like, Caitlin, you got to learn how to ride out that fear. Like someone had said they viewed it like a bull, like you're holding on to these thoughts and the thoughts are the horns of a bull, right? Mm -hmm. And the tighter you hold it onto it, you know, it's like under control, but, but the, uh, the more raging the bull gets. Mm -hmm. So, um, he said, you just gotta, you just gotta confront it mm -hmm. and at the same time, ride it out. Like, don't let it overtake you. So, um, he actually suggested doing something that the native Americans do, which is like, they, they tap their feet, they tap mm -hmm. their feet on the ground. And it's like, hmm, like you confront it and you, you grunt and you like acknowledge the fear mm -hmm. and let it go. So the thing is with that versus just letting it pass. Mm -hmm. It's going to come back again. But if you acknowledge it and let it go, mm -hmm. then you have asserted yourself over that. Because I also believe there is spiritual warfare there. So if you uh, mm -hmm. continually ignore everything that's passing through, mm -hmm. you may not really take authority over your mind. That you. That's, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Because oftentimes I'll tell people, I think we were going through it last week, where we were talking about, you know, um, not just letting the thoughts pass. Th letting the mm -hmm. thoughts pass is a good way to look at it because personally, I believe that none of our thoughts are really our own anyway. Um, yeah. And the way that I back that up is like, well, I didn't invent the, the English language or whatever your native tongue is. Um, yeah. Therefore, I mean, thoughts were created based on language. You wouldn't have these type of thoughts if you had no language. So I didn't mm -hmm. make that up. So I'm not making my thoughts up. Um, and also um, what I do to confront them is I look at it and I accept it. Right. So I was talking to my daughter the other day and she was like, you know, I have these obsessive thoughts and stuff. And I'm like, well, you're my kid. So you're probably going to right? so it's probably like a whole alphabet soup of things you're probably going to get. Um, and I was like, you know, the best thing to do is just watch it and say, yeah, that, that's what happens. Like my mind is prone to X, you know, um, people that are in abusive homes, their mind is prone to X people that um, have certain feelings, their mind's going to be prone to X. And you just confront it and say, hey. That's what my mind does. Like uh, one of my favorite quotes is by Alan Watts. And um, he says, you know, you can always find something to worry about if you're the worrying type. And I look at this in my life and I'm like, I worry when I make $5 a day and I worry when I make $20,000 a day. 
Like, <laughs> what gives? You know, what, what's the thing? Like, if I made $100 million in a day, I'd probably still be worried about it. You know, I'd be like, oh, what about taxes? What about this? <laughs> um, and it, being a worrying person, you're always going to have the worry. Being a fear-based person, you're always going to have the fear. And if you watch that and say, I confront this, I accept this as part of my life, it starts to go away because now instead of, like I was where I'm shaky and I'm like, I got to trust myself. I, I don't trust myself. And I was, I was searching for this trust. I let go and I gave in to the fear of uncertainty and said, Hey, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what it's going to be like, but I'm just going to stop fighting because this is here. I'm going to stop fighting it. And pretty soon it starts to go away. Um, that's something we see a lot in alcohol addiction where people are fighting their addiction, right? Instead of saying, Hey, well, Hey, you know what? When I drink, I don't stop. That's just what happens. Well, what if I try again in 10 years? Well, who cares? Let's think about right now and let's focus on the fact that I surrender to the fact that drinking is probably not for me um, or whatever it is, right? Whatever uh, your vice is, is not for you because once I accept that, it starts to dwindle. Do you ever see that or does that make sense to you? Totally makes sense. Yeah, because everything you're describing is just about confronting our shadow, right? And not mm -hmm. judging ourselves mm -hmm. and loving ourselves. And it's so hard for humans to love themselves and to let yourself feel loved um, mm -hmm. when you don't believe you deserve it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's part of the reprogramming. So yeah. um, I just wanted to add two to that, Marcus, mm -hmm. if I may. When we're, when we're like surrendering to those things, it's so important that you continue, you, you um, retell those stories right away. Because mm -hmm. here's another thing that we are conditioned to believe is that it would take years and years and years and years to undo layers and stuff. And what I've learned recently is I believe that's another kind of programming, you know, where they can make money off us. Mm -hmm. Because we have the power in our minds and our words to create and destroy like that. Like it's our nature. We are creators and destroyers. We are nature, you know? So mm -hmm. our power is like instantaneous, you know, like we, we are the power of God, right? So mm -hmm. if we, uh, once you detect those love and fear and what you have to surrender to and everything, it's important where you retell the story. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when we recount our past or uh, our fears or anything, we talk about, you know, I am afraid of this or I, um, I've been through this. This is what happened to me. But it's really important that we don't just acknowledge what happened or what we fear. But now it's like, okay, now let's say the truth. So yeah. the truth is, um, you know, and then you create your own reality create mm -hmm. your own truth because the truth is based on what we tell ourselves. Does exactly. that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it does. Definitely. And I like what you said about um, a lot of people think change takes forever. Um, and a lot of people think, oh, you know, you have to do all this stuff before yeah. you get sober. You have to do all this stuff or you have to go to 20 years of therapy Yeah, um, God. and things like that. And, and therapy is good. I mean, definitely go if it helps you. Um, but for me, I look at it and I'm like, I looked at, there was three guys or two guys back in the seventies and his books right here, really tripped out book. He was definitely from the seventies. You guys can see <laughs> that is from the seventies, right? It's gotta be. Um, and it's called frogs to princes, probably not the best book to start with if you're going to read Richard Bandler. Um, but he goes through and, he, and what they did is in the seventies, they went and looked at therapists that were getting results. They're like, okay. Here's this person that's like takes 50 years to, to heal someone and they're not even healed or whatever. Yeah. Here's this guy. Um, and they showed examples. They're like, I would go into a mental institute and what would happen is the doctors would treat the mental patients as mental, unable to get better. Like the whole idea was let's keep them there because they can't get better and they need to be out of society or whatever. And he would go there and he'd be like, what's the problem? And he's like, well, this guy thinks he's Jesus. And it's like, okay, well. Do you think you're Jesus? Yes, I am Jesus from the Bible, whatever. And he totally believed it, and they couldn't stop him. And then he's like, okay, well, I'll be right back. And he comes back in, and he's like, comes in with like a big, big plank of wood, and he starts measuring the guy. And he's like, okay, well, if you're Jesus, you got to be crucified. That's what Jesus did. And pretty soon the dude snapped out of it, right? Wow. And that's really what I look at everything in life is kind of a form of hysteria, right? You get in yeah. this bottle of hysteria where you're like, I believe this. I am consumed by alcohol i'm consumed by thoughts i'm consumed by depression um and we put those labels i am depressed yeah right? that, to me that's like one of the worst things you could say now i could have depression but i yeah. am not depressed that's not the sum of my being and one of the things i always say is 
you're not the sum of your thoughts, you're not the sum of your upbringing, and you're not the sum of what you've done or what has been done to you. And yeah. a lot of people come and they say, well, Marcus, you know, I was abused and this is who I am. And I'm like, well, you're not abused. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, that's not you. That's something right. that might have happened. And one of the things I look at also is, is when you have that. So, like, you had that experience with the, the con guy um, who messed up with you, you know, and just messed around and whatever. Um, not whatever. I don't mean to discount it, but oh, no, you did right. all that stuff. I, I get it. Yeah. And um, <laughs> if you were not there, it would have been someone else. Mm -hmm. And this is freeing because I look at it, and as a kid, I always said, well, why me? Why, me? why does this happen to me? Why do I get this person in my life? And it's like, well, hey, if it was another person, it would have been the same exact thing. It's not like the universe singled you out and said, this is what you're going to get. It's just that there's shit in the universe, and somehow you got a little bit of it to come your way. Um, and all through life, we look at life as things that happen to us rather than this is what's happening. I'm in it. Can I offer a, some sure. advice here? So mm -hmm. perspective. Okay, ready? Mm -hmm. uh, I believe everything happens for us. I also mm -hmm. believe that our souls choose the life we want because we 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 all go through a journey right and i believe in generational lineage whatever you know abuse starts from somewhere it's mm -hmm. it's up to one person to break that line of abuse it's up to sure. that one person to become healed how mm -hmm. can anyone be healed if they don't face their shit mm -hmm. oh i swear i'm sorry i said i did too I, don't I worry about it swear a lot. okay <laughs> <laughs> um but anyway so I just want to give you guys an example of how I reframe my stories. Um, first of all, nothing happens to me. Everything happens for me. Everything happens for me. And I have also, uh, so with my most recent circumstance, you know, this happened to me. I overcame. And, and just like um, Marcus was talking about wearing that badge of honor, that's what I was wearing. That's how a lot of us wear our new stories. Like, oh, I overcame this. I survived this. And then I was like, no, that's, I could feel it. I was like, that is not love based. That is still me surviving. Like I want to thrive. So to thrive, we have to go in the perspective of like, we have to see the other side of it. We have to go and see it from God's perspective. And we have to really understand the universe. And like Marcus said, like there's darkness, there's light, there's balance. It's called harmony and everything does happen for us, but it's up to you to understand the truth about, uh, you know, what did this add to your life? Cause another thing mm -hmm. that you need to realize, and this is where it comes to knowing your identity. Uh, the truth is we are all created in abundance. We are all love. We are fullness. Uh, that's who we are. Mm -hmm. So if that's the truth, things can only be added to us. We can't have things taken away. Mm -hmm. So here, stick with me with this. Mm -hmm. So when I, you know, I, I, I've been raped, I've been, you know, whatever atrocities. Okay. And when I got to the point and said, wow, when these things happened, I was added with so much grace and love. Like these things are what was actually added to me. Nothing was taken away from me. And, and the only thing that determines that is our mindset. Mm -hmm. So if, you if we walk around continually saying this happened to me, this happened to me, I'm a victim of this, you are literally undergoing, you're not even being yourself because you're still relaying a program of what happened to you. So in order to free yourself from that and be love and be light and be free, you have to let yourself surrender to love and mm -hmm. forgive and know that this happened for you. Mm -hmm. So um, in a way, I kind of believe a little differently, Marcus, of that mm -hmm. we, we're all on our individual paths and it is all for a reason. And the reason mm -hmm. you're going through it, um, not that it's not injustice or anything, that's not what I'm saying, mm -hmm. not that you don't deserve it, mm -hmm. but you are so much more powerful than what happened to you. And it's mm -hmm. your job to tap into that power because mm -hmm. that is what's going to be used to create the heaven of your life. Mm -hmm. Like if I didn't have those things happen to me, I would never know the heaven that I have now in my mm -hmm. mind. I would never have known myself the way I know now. And like, I am so grateful for the things that happened to me. So if you guys could start anywhere, just start practicing and staying grateful, even if you don't feel it, because eventually the thoughts will become feelings. And we are alchemists, so we can create any feeling we want. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, and it's interesting because it's like you look at it, and however you believe about that, I, I believe that everything happens for a reason, but I have no idea what the reason is, uh, mm -hmm. which is cool because I don't know. Like, like for me, I look at it, and I'm like, life sometimes is just 
not right to some people. Like I didn't choose to be born in America. A uh, poor kid didn't choose to be born in India, um, you know, and, and oppression and all this. And, and what I look at is we are love. We are more than everything thinks we are. Um, yeah. And we look at it and we're like, okay, well, the whole earth is abundant. Like starvation is not a food issue. It's right. a moral issue. Um, you know, money stuff. Money was a man-made invention. People just get so hung up on it. And it's like, well, just rewrite the rules. <laughs> it's pretty easy. You wrote them in the first place. Um, but we look at it and we're like, okay, well, when we have the love versus ego, and ego has like hate, has a victim. Um, there were some other ones you said as well. Love has the uh, trust. I trust myself. I trust others. I trust the universe to do what the plan is. Uh, whatever it is. It might look bad to me in the time. Like, oh, I lost my job. That's terrible. Now I can turn that around and say, I lost my job. I'm going to go for something better. That's a good way to reframe it. Um, you could turn it around and be like, I lost my job. I'm going to go on unemployment. Therefore, I suck. Everything sucks. Whatever. Um, however you frame that in your mind. But you can change them, which is really cool. Um, and you got to focus on it and say, hey, look, I'm going to I'm gonna live a life in love, in trust, knowing that there's an abundance and knowing that I can make a difference, knowing that mm-hmm. I can help people. I can... I can help myself, I can help my family, I can help others, I can change the way things are. Um, and when we get us in stuck in like a cycle of ego, because a lot of it's ego, like if you look at anxiety and you look at fear, it's all ego based. And it's all based in like, I'm not even gonna try to draw a lizard, pretend there's a <laughs> lizard there. Uh, it's all based in the lizard brain, you know, wh- where you're going through and you're like in protection mode. I gotta protect my ego, I gotta protect my identity, I gotta protect who I am, I gotta protect what the world thinks of me. Mm -hmm. And I found through uh, being really honest with yourself and you're like, you know what? I can fail. I don't always have the answers. I don't always know, but I can find out, right? And we look at that and and trying to protect that identity, trying to protect whatever you're projecting is ego-based, right? And if we we step back and we say, hey, you know what? I surrender to whatever because I, I don't know what I am, but this is what I want to try to be. Um, that moves to love. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. Yeah, I think that's really, really important. Surrender. Cool. It's like you said. I mean, everything is pretty much surrender. It's letting go of that control. I mean, that's what you said, right? Love Love is pretty much like identifying with love is just realizing you have no control and being okay with that. Exactly. Um, but but at the same time, also understanding that we, we, do, we do have control. We do have control because we determine who we are and our being. Yeah. Is determined by our thoughts. So I am, insert that, that is what you will be. You know, Mm -hmm. we are what we focus on. Like, that's Mm -hmm. a truth. So if you feel depressed, like a lot of us literally live by our feelings. We don't even realize it. The subconscious Mm -hmm. is just a bunch of layers of feelings that if Mm -hmm. we took the time to just say, you know, you have to kind of become a lunatic. Like you Mm -hmm. lose control in that way. Like Mm -hmm. where if you're feeling depressed, say, you know what? I feel great today. I am great. Mm -hmm. I am doing great. I love my life. Like, and you put on... Like, honestly, that's the best way I can describe it. Not to be, I know that, does that sound crazy? Do you know what I'm talking no, about? No, no, I get, I get what you're saying. So okay. it's like, you're <laughs> depressed so, so one day. Or you're afraid to lie to themselves. But the truth is, mm-hmm. you're not lying to yourself. You're, you're creating that new reality because you know your power. You know your creative power, you know? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I get yeah. it. And a lot of it uh, comes from, like, we look at our well-being as what happens outside of us and ah. happens to us. So it's kind Mm. of like, okay, well, I won the lotto, therefore I'm happy. I got a promotion, (laughs) therefore I'm happy. Um, Instead of looking at it and being like, in my body, there is happiness and there's depression. There is. Mm. No, it's in everyone. Everyone is created with all these feelings. It depends on what your body chemistry goes to. And I know for me, if I drink, it's like have a bottle of depression because I'm going to go get depressed. Even Even if I'm happy, like I've been almost five years sober and I'm happy and I love my life. But I know if I drank right now, if I drank, you know, enough, probably would only take me like five or six right now because I haven't drank in so long. Uh, that would spiral me there. So if you look at it and you say, well, you know, part of me is chemical. And that part of that chemical part of me feels depressed or feels run down. And like my um, gym coach always says, you know, we go in to work out and I get tired. And she's like, it's all mental. You can do it. It's, it's 100% mental. You're tired because of mental. And she's right because now I'm doing things that I was like, well, I wasn't able to lift the two pounder yesterday. How come I can lift the, <laughs> the four pounder today or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, and we look at that and it's like, that is both in you. There is both yeah. happiness, sadness, love, 
hate, all of these things are there. It is what you choose to focus on. And whatever you choose yeah. to focus on is the reality. If you have someone who's depressed, he wins the lotto, he thinks he's happy, he is happy. Right? It's just, it's evoking that. And in our minds and in our body, we have like these little points that go off. And it's funny because um, they did a study, uh, Bandler and Grinder, and they were talking about how things affect people. And if you're someone who is abused, and every time after you were abused, the abuser came up, put his hand on your shoulder, and said, I'm sorry. If I come up and I put my hand on your shoulder, you're probably going to get depressed, even though I'm not the abuser, even though I'm congratulating you, you're probably <laughs> going to get that feeling because that is associated with it. And what yeah. happens is we have all these associations that are firing, and it's like, boom, how do we live? It fires, then you get emotion. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, uh, well, you made a really good point. Um, one of my coaches told me, uh, you know, we're programmed in the world, in society, so we can serve the whole program system, right? Mm -hmm. Do, do be have, that's what we're taught. So mm -hmm. if we do X, then we'll be happy. Like you said, if we win, if we play the lottery, then we win it, then we'll be happy. And then we can have the life we want. Mm -hmm. That's a lie though. If we, once we be, we are designed as human beings. So once we choose to be happy, mm -hmm. we can do more, mm -hmm. uh, and have what we want. And I think even a step further, once we're happy, we are more. If we live from a place of happiness, we are naturally more, whether yeah. we're more in a job or whatever. Um, and it's funny because we look at it and it's like, do be have, this is all marketing stuff. Like I, I was reading ads from the thirties this morning to prepare for my other business. I love 1930s ads. Cause it's funny. It's like, Hey, you got a headache, drink Coke. Yeah. Are you depressed? <laughs> drink Coke. Um, yeah, there was one that I saw. I was like, are you suffering from depression? You need to have this new wine. And I'm like, what the hell? Seriously, you got away with that shit back then, <laughs> right? Um, and it's interesting because we're programmed because the more society has us unhappy, the more crap we're going to buy, right? The more you're going to go and spend money, the more you're going to do stuff. And what we have to look at is you look at cultures like India, you look at cultures like, um, was it Japan or China? One of them. And um, they focus on internal happiness. Like, what if I live from happiness out rather than trying to get happiness in? Okay, this mm -hmm. person makes me happy. I need to be around them. This money makes me happy. This Instead, what if I find the happiness that's already in me? Because those things are just triggering it anyway, right? Mm -hmm. You'd be happy if you won the $10,000 lotto or the million dollar lotto. It doesn't matter. It's just the happiness is in you no matter the amount. You need to find out how to find it in you and yeah. live from it. Marcus, that's such a good point because have you ever heard of the, the happiness addiction? Right, here's the thing. Imagine I think I had a book on that. I, I, I couldn't tell you what it was though, so go ahead. Okay, so they talk mm -hmm. about, it's like happiness is a destination. So imagine people, mm -hmm. if you get clean, you get recovered and stuff, and then you're still addicted to finding that feeling of mm -hmm. happiness. So you try to find a job or a relationship or a place or in money, and you still have the mm -hmm. same problem because everything is just, the, the entire problem is people become addicted to feelings and they don't mm -hmm. realize like, hey, feelings are just feelings, man. It's okay to, it's also, it's also okay to feel depressed. It's also okay to feel mm -hmm. sad. Sure. Just don't like attach yourself to that. Like why, you know what I mean? I, th I think people are so addicted to feeling happy when they don't realize that you can generate all these feelings in yourself. Like you're in control yeah. of that. It's yeah. not anything outside of you. Um, so yeah, good points. But I think it's really, really, really important to just note that I don't think happiness should anyone ever be someone's final destination. Well, it's like life. Life is a journey, not a destination. Uh, yeah, careers fall in love are a with journey. the journey. Sobriety yeah. is a journey, you know, and you look at it and it's like so many people are like this spring dude trying to fight it. And you're like, I'm going to push these feelings away. I can't sit with them. And I remember for me, it was like, I can't be sad. It was like, that was terrible. It was like being sad was the equivalent of just like catching on fire. <laughs> I was like, I got to put this fire out. I'm not good. And I was trying to fight it instead of just leaning back being like, well, you know what? Life's going to do what it's going to do. Sometimes, um, some days you just feel like shit. Some days yeah. I'm like, whatever. It, it's enough some days just to be like, whatever. I, I made it through the day. I didn't drink or I didn't do whatever. Um, and I'm okay. Right? Tomorrow, we'll do some other stuff. Maybe be better. Um, and just surrendering to the fact that sometimes you're going to have that stuff. Like, I know for me, I'm prone to anxiety. If I drink a cup of coffee, I get anxious. So I switch to decaf. Sometimes if I have regular, it starts coming in and my brain goes, you're anxious. Why, why isn't this gone? You're sober. What the heck's going on? Why, what's the problem? And I'm like, 
we had coffee, dumbass, you know? <laughs> I mean, obviously that's going to happen, um, you know, and we have to watch that in our life because a lot of those things happen. Let's see what we have in the comments here. I know there's a lot of them coming up. So we got <coughs> Andrea from Italy. Good to see you there. Uh, Crystal from New Bronx. Uh, Peggy says she's really struggling right now. Well, Peggy, share what you're struggling with, and we'll see if we can give you some light on the subject. We got uh, Crystal's 28 days sober. Awesome, Crystal. Andrea's got five days sober, which is great. Um, MM says, good morning. Let's take morning. Megan here. Uh, Megan says, I'm on day three for me, and I didn't drink any caffeine this time. I noticed it's been a lot easier this time without the caffeine as a crutch. I think it was really messing me up. I, I agree, because for me, I drank when I was anxious, or I knew I was going to be anxious. And so I didn't understand back then that the coffee made me anxious, the alcohol brought me down, then the coffee made me, and it was just a cycle. Instead, I was like, okay, well, let's, let's get rid of one or the other or both. Um, eventually, I got rid of both. I, I drank coffee like two years into my sobriety. I quit about two, three years ago. Um, and it was a game changer because these things affect us. I know uh, Diet Coke sometimes makes me angry. As much as I like it, I, I get angry, and I'm like, why am I pissed off? We had a Diet Coke, you know? Uh, it's, for some reason, there's, like, angry molecules. That's so good that you're something. so aware of your body. That's good. Uh, well, you have to be. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's the key is, is being aware and trusting that things are going to happen. Like sometimes stuff's going to happen. Sometimes if I don't get enough sleep, anxiety. Um, if I sleep too much, maybe, like, sluggardliness or whatever it's called right Sluggishness, um yeah, yeah. Uh, crystal says love you guys keeping me sober and learning a lot about myself i was sober for four years you taught me that i was a dry drunk the whole time we're glad that wow and that, that's what we're talking about so uh caitlin the term if you haven't heard it dry drunk have you heard that one no but i think okay. i understand so it's dry like drunk is like a um i'll explain it with my nana so my grandma was uh, alcoholic for most of her life she passed away two months ago um, she was alcoholic for like 60 years, 70 years, something like that. She had 16 husbands, literally like 14 <laughs> we know are on paper too. We don't know if they're actual real marriages, but we count them anyway because they were stepdad number 15 and 16, right? <laughs> um, and so she was uh, an alcoholic for a long time, and she was always cranky and bitter, but funny as hell. I mean, this lady would make you, like, die laughing because she just didn't care about social norms. She didn't care what people thought of her. She just did her thing. Um, and she got sober, and the only thing that changed was the alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. Everything else was the same. And a dry drunk is someone who gets sober, but the only thing that changes is the alcohol. Right? They're like, I don't drink. Like, you go into recovery meetings, and you see this guy in the back, and he's, like, 65 years old, and he's like, I can't fucking drink anymore. I hate my life. I, I wish I could drink like normal people. And you're like, well, what good did that do, <laughs> right? Um, and in the beginning, maybe it's just enough to not drink. You know, start there, because drinking spirals all this shit out of control, so you got to watch out for that. And maybe in the beginning, maybe you'll be a dry drunk. That's cool. Get to the place where eventually you're like, okay, now I'm okay. Um, but that's how the term works, and that's kind of what goes on. Um, and I think it's like a big fear for relapse, too, is if you're not dealing or, or like Caitlin says, not confronting your stuff, not saying, hey, this is what's going on, right? Uh, yeah, obviously I want to drink because I've been drinking so long, and it's been associated with good feelings so long. Unfortunately, my mind forgets, like, when I fell over and when I threw up and when I didn't feel good and when I embarrassed the hell out of myself. I don't think about those. I only think about, yay, anxiety gone. Um, yeah. But that's kind of an interesting one. So thanks for that, Crystal. Let's see who else we have. Stephanie says, honest fear versus truth love spot on. Good. Chelsea, language and how it is the origin of thought is a concept very well explained in the book, The Fifth Agreement. Hey, good. I think, is it the five agreements or fifth agreement? It might the be. The fifth agreement, I think. Fifth agreement? Okay, yeah. I, I have one called The Five Agreements. I don't have that. I'll have to get that book. Um, so that's good. Yeah, the fifth agreement, if you guys want to pick that up, probably a good one as well. Uh, dead weight. Hey, Marcus, I haven't had a drink since around Memorial Day, like five Ooh. months. Lost track. Your video and another good channel, Alcohol Mastery, were two that helped me most in psychological stuff. Psychological that's awesome. Stuff. That is cool. Um, let's see. THC Gamer got a doctor appointment. Cool. Good, good, good. Um, I hope it's cool. I hope everything's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, who is our guest? Our guest is Caitlin. Um, you can see her info in the description there as well. 
Let's see. Uh, Everyday Sober says she's a special guest with some great insight. And for those that don't know, Everyday Sober is our usual uh, co-host, Terry. Um, let's see who else we got. Stephanie, breathing through them works too. Yes, breath work is something I struggle with. I'm the guy in the gym that's like passing out because I hold my breath when I lift my two-pound weights. Um, you know, so that's something I got to work out. I'm trying to work on it. I'm learning about like yoga and stuff like that. Uh, and I am getting better. But uh, that's a big thing. Like for me, I know you're talking about that exercise of just kind of clearing your mind and thinking. For me, a big one is feet on the ground. Not like cross, yes. not anything, just feet on the ground, planted. Feel yourself in the ground. Maybe even if you're outside and it's a nice day, take your socks and shoes off and feel the grass. Right? Yeah. Become part of nature. Be like, hey, this is where I'm at. I'm here. I'm grounded. Um, and everything is okay right now. Because that's, that's the key is to realize no matter what happens in your life, no matter what's going on, if there's not a war right outside your door, you're okay right now. You probably Even got if there food. is a war outside your door. Even if further. there is, it's a little scary, you're okay. but, but we'll you're talk okay. about that for another one. <laughs> How to deal with the war outside. Um, but it's not as bad as a war in your mind, that's for sure. Uh, although I would not be an advocate of any wars. Um, Jason says, that's so excellent. You have five years. Thanks for that, Jason. Uh, Crystal says, I had so many negative thoughts when I was sober for four years, and of course I relapsed. And that's a fear, right? Because what happens is you can literally reprogram your mind. You can change your mind. And the way you're going to do it isn't by thinking about it. You can't think your way out of a thinking problem. You need to get new thoughts. And that's why I'm a big advocate. Ever since I got sober, every night without fail, I listen to an audio. I'll either listen to Ram Dass, I'll listen to Alan Watts, I'll listen to... Anthony DeMillo's pretty good, um, or something uplifting or positive or an audiobook or something like that, because it gives me new thoughts. It gives me new perspectives. Like for those of you who are listening to this and you're like, wow, I didn't think about it that way. You're getting new thoughts right now. Now it's your job to take those thoughts and say, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do something with it. I'm going to remember next time I have anxiety, well, shit, you had a cup of coffee. Let it pass, you know, and I'm going to focus on that because it's very, very important. All right, let's see. We got Samson. Hey, I relapsed so many times. Uh, I don't feel bad. It's how you get yourself back up and get on track. I'm still trying to figure out you're not alone. Exactly, because we can look at it. And, you know, for relapse, whether it's relapse to thoughts, relapse to alcohol, um, sometimes it, it, it could happen. Now, I don't plan on it. I don't bank on it. I'm not like every alcoholic needs to relapse, at least 14. I don't believe that, right? Some don't need to. Some maybe that's part of it. Um, but getting back up and saying, what can I learn from the last time? What can I learn from that that changed me? Where did it start? Because you can go back and you can look at where the thought started. And you could say, boom, that's the one. Okay, that's what I watch out for. Um, and focus on changing your thoughts. Okay, let's take uh, Jason says, I really like the fact that you brought up having the attitude of gratitude, a real life changer. And I think that was Caitlin brought that one up, uh, which is good. Okay, caffeine makes, my, caffeine makes my anxiety explode. Yeah, right there with <laughs> yeah. you. Um, four days sober, cleansing my apartment top to bottom. Good, good, good. Um, I'm not a cleaner. I hate cleaning, but awesome. Um, that is good. We need to have clean areas, clean rooms and stuff. Although here, my dog always gets a big log from the outside, and she's like a wood chipper. She's like literally having a wood chipper in here, and I have all these wood chips swept up over here that I need to get out of here. So that's my cleaning for the day. Um, let's see here. Samson says, uh, I'm only on day eight. Day eight's a big, that's a big change. That's like eight days of no drinking. That's a big step. Um, and I'm feeling more aware, more active, and trying to be a better father and husband. But I'm realizing now I need to do this for myself. Exactly. Because it's like in an airplane, right? You go in an airplane and they say, um, the masks are going to fall if there's a cabin pressure change. Now, when the mask falls, put the mom, if you're a mom, put your mask on first. And my wife's always like, I'm not going to let her, no way, man, we're putting the kids on. The reason they say that is because they know little Timmy's going to be running up and down the aisles like a maniac. Johnny's going to be swinging from one of the little tubes. And you're going to be fighting so much by the time you get their oxygen mask on, you're going to be out of oxygen and you're going to be on the floor. So they say that because you need to take care of yourself first, not because, oh, I'm a selfish mom, boom, my alcohol, or my, um, I don't think they pump alcohol through those. My um, <laughs> oxygen's going to come first. That's not what it's about. It's about you need to take care of yourself so that you can 
be a better father, be a better husband, be a better wife, child, whatever, uh, which is pretty cool. Okay, um, Ivy says, I guess I'm a dry drunk. Well, um, learn, right? Learn how to change your thoughts. Learn how to enjoy sobriety. Learn how to enjoy every day. Um, Stephanie, read this once, found it reassuring. You're not the first. You're not the last. You're the only. All right, oh, cool. Wow. Uh, Caitlin, you want to take a couple of the last questions there? Um, okay. I think we started. Can, we can were you at... read them out loud? Can you read them? Oh, to me? sure, sure. Um, <laughs> I'm now like two months and two weeks found harmony and peace. No more feeling shit and guilt of what I've done. Good. Mm-hmm. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, and, and remember, guilt is a completely useless emotion. Yeah. Like, yeah. guilt you can is. Yourself. What's that? Oh, I just said they have to forgive themselves. Yeah, yeah and, and look at it like guilt is a way of feeling better without actually being better. Like one of the things I learned is that if you want to amend the way your life is, if you want to do better, if you want to show that you have changed, be the change. Right? Instead of going and saying, well, I've, I feel really bad about getting drunk and yelling at my, my kid or whatever, um, I could go and I can say sorry every day, every time I do that, but it doesn't do anything. What does better is putting the bottle down and saying, I'm, I'm not going to yell at my kid anymore. We're, we're going to read. We're going to, you know, pile up stuffed animals and, and make a fort or whatever. And we're going to be different. And guilt is only a way of feeling better. Man, I feel so shitty about drinking last time. Uh, I feel so bad about it. Pretty soon you're drinking again. Exactly. But if I say I feel bad about drinking, I'm going to actively do something to stop. Um, so, and, mm-hmm. oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, Marcus, so now what, like, how, how would we generate feelings the opposite of guilt, which is really gratitude and mm-hmm. loving yourself would be saying like, you know what? Thank you that I'm stopping. Thank you that I, I am me. Like, don't even mm-hmm. focus on your drinking or focus mm-hmm. on who you are and like start thinking yourself and loving yourself and praising yourself. I would, I would say that. Yeah, Do that. Absolutely. Like first thing in the morning and last thing at night. Just, you mm-hmm. know, thank you, God, for making me. Thank you, God, that I am. Thank you, God. You know, mm-hmm. you'll still have feelings of guilt, but then you're not serving those feelings of guilt. And soon exactly. those feelings will be gone. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's the thing is like, I remember we learned early on, hey, you want self-esteem? Do esteemable acts. Like mm. if you want self-esteem instead of sitting there and reading books about it, which is good, but do esteemable <laughs> acts. Like you want self-esteem? Go feed people who can't, who don't have the means to eat. You want self-esteem? Take care of people who can't take care of themselves. You want self-esteem? Go help someone. Um, do something that is esteemable and you'll get that. Um, and I always look at life as how can I make what I want in life inevitable, right? So how can I make, like, I want to be sober, Marcus. I want to have these things. One of my goals is I want to reach a lot of people with this, with this uh, sober show is how do I make that inevitable? Well, what I do is I come on, and if there's one guy on, I talk to one guy. There's two guys on, we talk to two guys, right? And now we got, you know, 50 or 100 or whatever on, we talk to those. And we look mm-hmm. at it, and we're like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do little steps, whatever it is, right? Because, again, it's the whole idea uh, Caitlin was talking about of the destination. You're looking at this destination of um, I'm going to be sober, my thoughts are going to be clear, and I'm going to have a bunch of money in the bank. It's like, okay, that's, that's good to have. Now make it inevitable. What's the first step to making it inevitable? Inevitable is um, not drinking. So, okay, what can I do today to not drink? What can I do today to be grateful of my life without having to drink? Because drinking – basically puts you in ego mode like that's what it does that's why people are asses when they're drunk because they're in ego mode they're like hey man i'm better than you and it's like well five seconds ago you were like a totally cool guy and now you're better than everyone ready to beat everyone up right (laughs) or maybe you wallow in self-pity guess what self-pity is ego a lot of people don't think this they think self-pity is oh oh, you know i don't have any ego i'm no that's ego you are so focused on yourself that you can't focus on other things and we got to look at that stuff and I just want to add one more thing, um, mm-hmm. because Marcus had said, uh, do this to be grateful, but I would switch that. Be grateful first mm-hmm. and do for yourself so you can do for others, because Absolutely. this is what keeps us trapped. Uh, church teaches us this. Society teaches this. Go out into your community. Serve, serve, serve. And before you know it, we mm-hmm. abandon ourselves mm-hmm. and uh, don't tend to ourselves. But it says to create a new self. There's a, there's a famous yogi 
Um, he came, I believe he taught in the 90s and 2000s in California, uh, okay. Kundalini. Uh, mm -hmm. Marcus, if you're in, starting to get more grounded, I totally recommend, mm -hmm. and anyone who's watching this, Kundalini, kundaliniyoga.org. Okay. It will teach you how to, just within like five minutes a day, that starts you learning meditation and breathing, okay, and being mm -hmm. present. And one of the things he teaches is to create your new self, to truly find yourself, you must spend a lot of time alone. Mm -hmm. So I would just advise anyone, like, you have to be comfortable being alone and doing for yourself. And most importantly, being, being your, by yourself so you can do for yourself and then you can do for others. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. Like if you, if you start from gratitude, it changes everything because yeah. you're just like, whatever, I'm happy. Like I remember, um, when I first got sober, I, uh, I always felt like I lost my house, even though I sold it and got a bunch of money mm. for it. Uh, I always felt like I lost it, right? And I, people were like, but you got, like, money. And I'm like, yeah, but, but I lost it because I was drunk. Um, and, you know, it's funny because I actually found, because we, we were going to move to Florida and everything happened so fast, we had to rent for a while because I was like, okay, well, we can't buy a house in 10 minutes. So um, <laughs> my wife had rented a place when I was in uh, rehab. And I remember getting there, and I actually found the will to be grateful for that. It was about a third of the size of the place we were used to. It wasn't where we wanted to be. I felt like a failure, but I was still like, I'm, I'm grateful. I have a place. I'm grateful that I'm here. I'm grateful that the sun's out. I'm grateful that uh, life is okay. I'm grateful that I'm breathing. I'm grateful that my kids are okay. Um, and, you know, if you lose someone, like, I'm grateful that I had them in my life rather than yes. I'm sorry for the loss. I'm grateful that they were here. Like, look at that. I got... 50 years with this person or 20 years or five years or whatever. Um, and that's kind of a good thing to look at is, hey, I can come from a place of gratitude. Let's see. We've got a lot of other comments coming in here. And where did we leave off? Um, so we got Samson said, Marcus, I noticed that the last time I was trying to get sober, I had an issue in my life that made me upset and immediately went for a beer, which turned to a bottle a day uh, is it finding an excuse? Well, what I would do is I would learn to live with uncomfortable feelings. Sometimes you might have them. I remember I was terrified of anxiety before, and it would just cripple me. And now I'm like, whatever, it's there. I had too much coffee or this. Um, or maybe you're, you're upset. Okay, today I'm, I got a little upset. That's cool. I am not upset. I have this upset thing that's, that's hanging around me, and that's cool. But I don't have to identify with it. I don't have to own it. I don't have to go in it and I don't have to run from it right that's one of the things is is so many people in life are spending their entire life running from things they don't want instead of just embracing what's already there like mm. you can be happy you can accept yourself you can be grateful you can sit and be upset and be okay you could be like I am Marcus I'm happy but I'm a little upset about this thing right and then again look at the ego because a lot of it if it's dealing with personal stuff like sometimes people are going to rip you off. Sometimes people are going to mess around. Some people, people, sometimes people aren't going to honor their, their promises or whatever. And you just look at it and be like, well, that's just, that's their bag. That's cool. It has nothing to do with me. Um, I'm going to do what I'm going to do and they're going to do what they're going to do. And this is how we, we live and move in the world. Welcome to the human condition, right? Yeah. Um, I haven't ad had a drink since December 18th. Congrats on 45 days or 50 days or whatever that would be. Um, Denise, still drinking, but really want to stop. It's a vicious cycle. I'm afraid to stop because I don't want to face the anxiety, but drinking causes more anxiety. <laughs> yeah. Um, now have you dealt with lots of anxiety issues? Oh yeah. I used to have to pull over my car because I would like mm -hmm. faint. I would almost faint having panic mm -hmm. attacks at work. Um, and it's crazy, Marcus, so you're religious, right? <laughs> I used to be. I, yeah. thought, I thought my, yeah, I, well, I, I was in the church a lot too. I thought my panic attacks and my emotions were the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Not the Holy Spirit. No. <laughs> no. It's the coffee or the, the, the uh, racing thoughts or whatever. Um, and yeah. it's interesting, too, because I remember when I was in the church, I actually used to be a street preacher uh, in Santa Monica. and we would stand I did that as well in Dallas. Did you? Okay. Well, we got to talk more. This is the first time I've ever <laughs> talked to Caitlin. I'm like, okay, she seems really cool. I think we'll get along. So. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I did a street preaching and it was interesting because the first night, like this homeless guy just shoved me off the stool and pushed me into a tree. Um, <laughs> I was like, okay, that's interesting. Um, but I remember the church would always tell me like, take every thought captive, 
And it was like this <laughs> war with dots and everything. And I'm like, you know, you'd sit there in church and you're like, you think of something stupid. Like I could just punch that guy over there. He looks like an idiot anyway. And you're like, why am I thinking that? That's terrible. And it's like, well, it's chemical impulses in the brain from yeah. stimulus coming in. And you're going to think these things. Right? Like if you had all the stimulus coming into your brain and you put it in your computer, your computer would like freak out. So why are we any different? Um, and we have to look at that and say, hey, these things are going to happen. You're going to have these impulses, these memories, these recognitions, this fear-based stuff. Uh, and what we have to do is just be like, hey, it's there. That's cool. I'm still at church or wherever I'm at. It doesn't mean I'm bad if I thought that. It doesn't mean I'm good if I think this. It just means this is where we're at. Yeah, right? this is where we're at. And I, I always tell uh, my clients, I say, you know, you can anticipate these. You, you know your brain well enough now. Great. Mm -hmm. Now, not, don't judge yourself. Let's just create a response plan. You yeah. know, don't try to escape them. But when those feelings come, what are you going to do about it? Exactly. And yeah. the only answer you can really do is really sit there, train yourself to be calm, mm -hmm. master yourself, master calmness. And then what, because actually what interrupts thoughts is mm -hmm. breath. You cannot breathe and think at the same time. So whenever those thoughts come, mm -hmm. just breathe. That's all you can do. Just breathe. Yeah. And don't go to the bar and breathe. Breathe outside of yeah. the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see here. We got Chelsea says, yes, guilt is a wasteful and painful emotion. I felt very empowered after I learned to accept all the mistakes I had made in my life. And I think the next step is forgiving other people. Absolutely. Oh. Um, I, I find, I found that in, it's weird because recovery was more than recovery for me. Cause you look at people who are recovery, it's just drinking, but recovery really was like a, a complete, I woke up one day and I'm like, holy shit, everything I ever thought about life is wrong. Yes. And I was like, I was, it was like, I was empty and I'm like, uh, okay. Uh, you know, I used to be like crazy Republican business guy and I'm like, and then I get sober and I'm like, well, let's see what old Bernie Sanders has to say. I mean, I guess every, and then I was like, Hey, I like this guy, you know? And then I was like, before I'd be like, we well, can't listen to that guy. He's a whack job. And I'm like, well, let's see, maybe whack jobs got something, you know? Um, and I kind of like flipped everything. And when I looked at that, it was like, now I can have gratitude for people because I can't judge anyone. I mean, my mind will judge, sure, because I'm trained to be like, oh, that person's too short, short too tall, whatever. Um, and, and we're trained that way. But now I'm looking at it and I'm like, hey, I can't be better than anyone because if I was in your position, I'd do the same thing. Like, How could I judge you? If I was in um, India like trying to find food on the ground, I'd feel the same way he felt. I'd do the same things they did. Right. I, and, and one of the things that's interesting is sometimes we don't know what would happen. Like we look at things like the Sanford prison experiment where they took a bunch of random people and they're like, we're going to make a movie and we're going to pretend you guys are the prisoners and we're going to pretend you're the guards. And after a couple of days of this, it started getting really bad because people believed the role. They were like, yeah, I'm the guard. They were beating the hell out of these people. And it's like, dude, this is an experiment. What are you doing? And yeah. it shows that certain circumstances can do that to us. But we also look at, um, there's a guy, Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor, and he talks about atrocities that happen. And this guy made it through one of the worst ones. And they're like, well, how did you make it through? And he's like, well, I didn't believe I was trapped. I didn't believe the things that they told me. I didn't believe that this was because of me, and I didn't own it, right? Now, that, I, I probably couldn't do that. Like, if I was in that camp, I probably would have, like, died before they even put me in it. Probably would have died on the train because I'm, like, a freak out. But for him, you look at it, and it's like that mindset changed. And there's so many other people that have mindsets and program mindsets. But if he can use that mindset for something as, as atrocious as what happened, and we can take it to our little things, sometimes perspective is what we need. Sometimes we look at it as, like, yeah, I lost my job, but, hey, that guy has nothing. I, I still got shoes. I could still get unemployment. I still got a roof over my head. Um, oh, my debt's not paid off. Well, who cares, right? Like, you can pay it off later. You can pay it off. It doesn't even matter, right? You're making it matter in your mind. And the funny thing about life is when you stop making these things matter, they start taking care of themselves. Now, that's not to say be reckless and go, you know, my bill's going to take care of itself because it won't. But life will work itself out if that makes sense. Okay. Let's see here. Samson, I'm only 31, and yes, it's hard to stop. And yes, you will face so many issues when you stop, but after a few days, things will slowly change. 
I faced seizures when I stopped, but I'm trying and it's worth it. Yeah, that, that's one thing to watch for too. If you guys are coming off of alcohol and you're, you're like, I'm going to quit cold turkey, um, <laughs> go to the doctor. Just like, even if you think you're fine, your body's had so much alcohol, you need to go to the doctor anyway and be like, hey dude, this is how much I've been drinking. What should I do? And he might give you something that'll help because seizures are a big worry. Um, delirium is a big worry. Uh, insanity is a big worry. Um, and, you know, that those, you don't want to mess around with that stuff. Okay, Crystal says, I didn't realize self-pity was part of my ego. That's a huge shift in my <laughs> thinking uh, when I was drinking. Absolutely. Um, a, lot, a lot of people don't realize self-pity is self-pride. You're thinking, I should have better. I should have more. Um, and whenever you think you should have more or better, make a goal to make a life to do it, but also look at the person with less and be grateful for what you have. Um, it's like that old tale that's like uh, the guy complained about his shoes until they met the guy with no feet. And it's like, well, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, you know. I think I just would also like to say that being grateful, it's just like you don't have to have any. It's not about having anything like get that mindset, you guys. It's just about like just be be happy mm -hmm. because you choose to be happy because you can generate that feeling in yourself. It doesn't matter what's going on within or outside you. Be grateful because you are, mm -hmm. exactly. you know, it's a very deep thing. But if you can practice that, then you'll begin feeling it from your soul up into your brain. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing you got to realize is that. Right now, where you're at, you are enough. Mm -hmm. You're enough right now. For where you're at in your life, you're enough. Like, you don't need anything. You don't need to have certain clothes. You don't need to have a certain job. You don't need anything to be enough. Like, whatever the universe is that created you, created you enough. And exactly. You can live from that. And it's like, hey, it, like, it didn't make a mistake. It wasn't like, oh, well, you, you know. I didn't mean to put old Johnny in the slums, you know, and Marcus over in Irvine. No, it meant that, you know, for whatever reason. I don't know what the reason is, but wherever you're at, if you're in the slums, you're enough. Find a way to be grateful. Find a way to um, change your, your situation, wherever you're at, if that makes sense. I might have trailed. I don't know. Um, let's see here. Chelsea says gratitude towards nature is grounding. Yeah, I love nature. Um, mm -hmm. I remember when we first moved to Florida uh and still today i walk outside and i'm like oh yeah this is out here i got trees and and you know i like trees and they're pretty cool um so grounding with nature realizing hey we're all part of this whole thing like i am one of eight billion people on the earth i'm no better i'm no worse i'm just one and when you realize that that could be like completely devastating because our school taught us yay you're the best you're the best <laughs> um but when you realize that it could be either be depressing or it could be the most liberating thing in your life because you're like, I'm one of eight billion. I'm just part of this, you know, and I get to be part of it, which is pretty cool. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Uh, me to understand anxiety better than any doctor. Uh, I think there was a first part of that that I didn't catch. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, that didn't come out correct. All right, if you want to <laughs> retype it, we'll, we'll read it. He spilled coffee on his keyboard and it's going crazy. See, coffee even makes your keyboard anxious so yeah gotta watch out for that stuff i know some people love their coffee dad i'm joke. cool with that i like uh, yeah it was a bad joke um, no dad joke I oh said dad joke yeah <laughs> yeah my kids are like dude really you you think that's funny that's cool but then sometimes i get them like we have this thing in our family where when one kid just laughs uncontrollably we're like oh she's out she's out you know and and we have those moments which is good um so yeah, just focus on that and focus on the fact that you are not the identity of what's been done to you. You're not the identity of whatever your thoughts tell you they are. Um, you're more. And if you believe that and you understand it and you're like, hey, I can get through this. This is cool. Like, I, I don't need to drink because these thoughts are just little triggers. These are little things that happen, right? I don't have to drink through my thoughts. I don't have to drink through my anxiety. Um, and I can live and move in the world just feeling, just sitting out there being like, hey, you know what, I'm going to breathe, and maybe sometimes I feel sad. Maybe sometimes I'm happy. Maybe sometimes I'm this. Maybe sometimes I'm that. But our world, unfortunately, has this idea that somewhere on the planet Earth, there's this guy who's always perfectly content and happy with everything. Now, they'll have you believe that it's wealthy movie star people, but I actually think, uh, which is funny, there was a story uh, Ramdas tells, and he's like, here I am. 
uh, he was a professor at Harvard. He got into the LSD experiment, and then he went to India to find himself. And so he just had made a bunch of money as a, as a professor. He got kicked out because he did the LSD. He goes to India, and he's like, here I am in India, and I'm strutting the streets. And I'm like, I got my a uh, American Express traveler's checks. I got my credit card. I got everything. And I'm watching the people. And I'm like, I feel bad for that guy. He's only got, like, a little flappy thing that he wears, and he doesn't even have, like, a wallet. I feel bad for him. Ah, that guy, you know, he looks pretty... And he starts feeling bad for all these people in India, and then he figures out, wow, these people feel bad for me because I'm so attached to my stuff for happiness that I can't even live. This guy here, he doesn't need things to be happy. He doesn't need an identity. He's just like, whatever, I just sit on my... I think they call it a tucket. Right? I sit on my little tucket, and that's what I do all day, and I'm happy because I'm happy in and of myself as existence, um, which is cool, and you can... Once you get that, get that and then go for the goals. Get that and then go for the stuff because you can do more things. You can talk to more people, make more money or whatever you want, but start from a place of, hey, I'm okay right now. So I hope that helps you guys. I don't think we have any last-minute questions, and we definitely want to give a big thanks to Caitlin for being here from, um, what was it, uh, Story Speak? Story Speak <laughs> Enterprises. Enterprises. Yeah. Um, it sounds huge. I remember like, I was like, I think she's up in like some big high rise that says Story Speak Enterprises on it. I named uh, it that way so you'd think so. <laughs> there you go. I remember when I first started my business, I was like, okay, I got PCMoneyMaking.com and I'm going to make my email. Back when email was like a big thing, I was like, I'm going to be executive at PC Money Making. And I'm like, I'm the executive. And it's like, really, there's some dude in like a room, you know, <laughs> like probably hasn't even showered yet answering your email. I was like, okay. Um, but yeah, you got to look at that. Okay, let's see here. Changing my mindset was very important to my getting sober. Awesome, Terry. Uh, Chelsea, yes, MN Mama. Think of your upcoming vacation as a chance to enjoy nature around you. Enjoy feeling the wind on your skin, birds and trees. It'll bring you calmness and peace without a drink. Absolutely. Um, connecting to nature is a big thing. Just close your eyes, feel the wind, feel the sand or the dirt, or wherever you're at. The concrete, if you're in a city. Um, and, and just feel where you're at. Open your window. Um, take time away from screens and, and, and computers and stuff like that because that's a big trigger. I know, uh, you know, I watch people in social media because I do this stuff for a living, um, and they get wrapped up in, oh, this is what Johnny has. This is what this guy's doing. Yeah. This guy's got a happy life, and it's like, we don't know that. We have no idea. And why compare mm -hmm. anyway? Uh, I was telling my daughter the other day, uh, she was talking about stuff, and I'm like, you know, it's funny because in life, I'll, I'll be doing fine. And last year I did, I was happy with what I did in my business. I was like, it was one of the greatest years we've had in a long time. Um, and I was content. And then I see the guy with like doing 10 times what I'm doing. And I'm like, oh man, you know, that kind of thing. But it's like, but five minutes ago, you were totally happy, right? It's <laughs> like you, you buy your house and you're happy and then your friends invite you over and it's a bigger house and you're like, oh shit, I don't have that, right? And it's like, be grateful what, for what you do have because that is enough if you choose it to be enough. If you don't choose it to be enough, then it probably won't be. Um, yeah. So hopefully that helps. Awesome. MM Mama's going to be in Florida. All right, maybe we'll see you. I've been wanting to go to the beach lately. Um, Marcus, can I add one, one final thing? You sure, guys? absolutely. We've talked we talk about a lot of having stuff, right? But mm -hmm. uh, another form of consumerism today is information. Like mm -hmm. uh, a lot of you, I'm sure, you know, you can read every self-help article. You can, mm -hmm. everyone's always going to tell you something you should be doing or could be doing or aren't doing. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important to just detach from everything and ev what everyone's telling you and all their information. And it goes back to trusting yourself. Like you yeah. have all the wisdom you need. So you mm -hmm. have to really just sit with yourself and yeah, nature will help with that. But I just, mm -hmm. something to be aware of. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Cool. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed our guest talk today and we look mm -hmm. forward to seeing you next week on Thursday at 11. Um, I think Talk Sober right now is being rebooted, so it might not be live, but when it comes back online, if you want to help the show, go on over there, check out the stuff, get the uh, 31 sobriety letters. We got other stuff for you. I think Caitlin's also going to send us over some worksheets she had made, um, so yep. we'll put theirs there there as well. So go to Talk Sober. Wait till the end of the day to do that uh, when the site's back online, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks Bye. again. Bye. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Caitlin.